Thank you very much, uh, John. And, and thank you for coming here on a beautiful afternoon. Um, okay, so the, the, um, the first part of my talk is going to be a little bit historical uh, before I move on to the, uh, the topic as such. So it will be structured into three areas. So I'll talk about my journey to Sheffield. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Um, um, it's a bit of history, so you know more where I come from and so on. James only this morning asked me, where do I come from? So I'll tell you this afternoon. Uh, so um, I think it's important to, to understand uh, my background and where I have been, where I have worked, and, and so on, which has, probably has contributed to what, what I am now, really, as an academic, but also as a person. Um, so I think it's quite important. I'll go quite quickly through that, and then uh, the main part of my talk is about the uh, aging and the big retirement research I have done through the project that uh, Fionn has mentioned uh, in uh, the three universities where I've been here in the UK more recently. I will talk also about policy and practice, what this research is feeding into actually action, what is taking place in the environment. I'll show you some examples in terms of standard waiters of implementation. Some of it has taken place around this building, as you can see, uh, the new streets and so on. Then, uh, I think some of you know Elizabeth Burton, who sadly we lost about a couple of years ago. Uh, and I'd like to talk about her legacy workshop be because I feel duty to move it forward uh, the way we have planned it uh, uh, in March 2014. So I'm going to highlight a few things that came up in that workshop uh, and then how we can move forward. Then I will finish with talking about my PhD completion. Some of them are here. Some of them are stuck in the trains. Um, so hopefully Nick can make it. Um, so I come from Algeria. Some people think I'm a gypsy from Spain, some they think I'm a, uh, from Egypt, some think from Colombia. So that, that red dot is where I come from. It's on the Mediterranean coast. It's a beautiful place. Uh, so, um, and this is my roadmap. So to get to Sheffield, I had to go through 12, 11 cities. The 12 being Sheffield, I clocked 25,000 miles. That's a round trip around the globe um, and 20,000 days or so. So, um, but... It's more than that. In a controlled environment, which doesn't exist, I could have done it like this. Yeah, but it doesn't exist, you know. There are lots of things in life that are out of our controls, and therefore we, we follow whatever it's offered to us. Then here, you know, my birthday, uh, 12 October. I was born in this city called Intimoshet, which was basically designed by the French for uh, wineries. Lots of wineries to support the, the wine production around the area. It's a sleepy town. 30,000 people or so, now it's about 300,000. But uh, so I grew up there up to uh, my um, um, baccalaureate, which is the A level. At that time, Algeria was in war against the French, who colonized Algeria since 1830. And just about a year or so before that, we had the visit of Charles de Gaulle in the town. And you can see on the left, yes. Um, Algérie Française, ici la France, which was, Algeria was a territory, French territory, and we had to live under this second class citizens. It was horrendous, obviously. Our parents suffered a lot. So anyway, this is an important because it somehow shaped uh, the, my generation, and I have Mohammed here also, and Amir. Uh, we are slightly different from our parents and very different from our children, obviously. Now, if you want to know a little bit about the Algerian war, there is lots of uh, publications. But the important thing is that it is France's undeclared war up to now. They don't admit there was a war with one more than a million people. Died. Anyway, we move quickly. If you have time, I suggest you watch this, La Bataille d'Alger. It's a fantastic movie, one of the best ever made in 1966, shot on location in the Casbah of Algiers, which is the Medina type, and the score is by Ennio Morricone. So even the music is quite extraordinary. Now, then I moved to Oran because Timushan, this little sleepy town, didn't have a university, uh, where uh, I studied architecture for five years. It's a French system. It's taught in France. And Oran is, was one of the most beautiful cities, I think, in the Mediterranean. And because of that, because of its setting, because it looks into the Mediterranean, people are much happier. And it links into this well-being thing. The city influences people. And, and that's quite unique, is actually, in Algeria. It's one of the happiest cities I think. And there I met Mohammed, I'm going to talk about him in a moment. So this is early 20s where we were carefree. And Mohammed 
I don't know if you can spot me. I'm the one on the bottom left. Bottom left. And Mohammed here has, has been on my side. We were so handsome. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So Mohammed has been on my side since 1980. I won't say how many years. But, uh, it's incredible. Some of these friends were still in touch. Some sadly passed away. But some are in France and Algeria. So. Oran is the birthplace of Yves Saint Laurent. So, now, the people I'm going to talk about are what we call the Pied Noir, the settlers who third, second, third, fourth generation. Yeah? And then after that, post colonial architecture is us, basically. Yeah? So, Albert Camus, maybe some of them have read some of his work, he's a Nobel Prize winner. He's another Pied Noir born in Algeria, and Derrida also. So, some of us we use lots of his texts because they are linked to this uh, the philosophy of the environment and so on. And then some of the post-colonial figures, apart from the politicians, which are quite overwhelming, we have Asiya Jabbar, a significant figure who, who uh, passed away in 2015, also an academic filmmaker and writer. So one of the significant figures that we can mention. Okay, done, done with Algeria now. I got uh, my degree and then I got a scholarship to come to the UK to do a um, a master's, two years master's by research now. So I arrived to Reading, 56, to do English language, because at the time I could say, my name is, uh, I couldn't articulate a sentence, to be honest. Uh, so we did one year intensive course. And Mohammed went to, to Leeds. We were spread uh, all over the country. And then after that, I moved to Oxford Brooks. At the time, it used to be Oxford Polytechnic, where Richard, I met Richard, and Richard supervised my MPhil and PhD, uh, and has been my friend since, and, and my mentor, and much more. So thank you, Richard, for, for all that. Um, so anyway, I, I finished uh, the Anfield, but all about that, then I met Liz Marina on 12th of March, 1988. So she was my lobster, my, my everything. And then a week later, we got married. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just trying to see if they're paying attention. I think they are. They are. And that's my father there to the right hand side. God bless him. So we got married. Life was simple and, and so on. And then PhD in July. You can see Chris Cross and Nabil Hamdi and Richard just behind me. Celebration was the 8th of July. I was grilled on the 7th of July. And then the party was the 8th of July. So, and after that, I worked for a year with, uh, with Richard and, and so on. Uh, and after that, uh, gosh, I don't want to restart. Um, immigration was quite difficult at the time compared to nowadays. My visa finished and I had to pack and get out of the country, basically. Uh, then, um, okay, decision times, as you can see here. Uh, and then I managed to get a job in Saudi Arabia. It's very close to, uh, to Yemen. Very interesting place, um, but incredibly challenging, obviously, especially for us mixed marriage and so on. Uh, but I had a close encounter with the Tihama tribe. I don't know if you uh, Very, very interesting people, but you cannot get to them. They're quite uh, segregated, remote. Nobody talks to them, and armed and dangerous. Um, and then from that, thanks again to Richard, who put me in touch with Professor Raymond Burton. They were set up a new school of architecture in. in uh, in uh, Lefke in Cyprus, and that was my uh, love story with Cyprus since then. And then this guy came. He was so cute. I think he's still cute. He's still cute. Yeah. Um, so these are the, the, the milestones so far, and after that, this happened. I'm not going to talk about this because I'll be here all night. So uh, I worked obviously in Queens and Newtland, which we'll talk about that, but also in Los Angeles, which is. Fantastic university as well, but environment challenging. And in the Middle East and uh, in the United Arab Emirates. So anyway, if you want to, to track your own journey, I suggest you use this trip line and look and reflect. Yeah. I mean, it, for me, it has been an incredibly uh, emotional uh, experience looking back at my, my life and my career so far, and, you know, looking at old photos, people who are not here. Uh, but I said, I must talk about it. So now you know me, there's no more questions. Don't ask me where I come from. Yeah? Okay, so I moved to the research here, and uh, I'll have maybe half an hour or so. Now, I thought first I'll show you the timeline. 
the publication. And then you can correlate the year with the country. Where there is funding, there is no funding. Where teaching is five days a week, and where teaching is one day a week. And then where you produce or don't produce. So anyway, I thought the journals in particular here to see where I've been more productive than others. Um, but anyway, apart from Opus Academia, I had the chance to do some master planning for the university in Cyprus. I also designed the Faculty of Architecture in there, which is famously known for the color building. Uh, and then I've designed a uh, multimedia library in the uh, Alliant University, and my house, my retirement house in Cyprus. So, uh, but I also was lucky to have the visit of the Sheikh of Dubai, you can see here, or in April 2006. So I was blessed by his visit, and he attended five minutes of my lecture for research methods. So, okay, so if I map, for example, the uh, expertise, topics, themes, or thematic analysis with my, my publications, my research, and so on, you can see there is sustainable design across the board. I started with housing studies, urban design, vernacular, somehow, because of the jobs and the demands, I moved into architectural computing, GIS, because there was also money and research a little bit. But more recently, since I moved to... Um, to uh, Queens, I started the aging, and that was thanks to Una here. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, and then he moved into more about design for health and well-being. Now, my early research has, on the left-hand side is the PhD in the Anfield and all this developing world research, the challenges of providing uh, affordable, at the time we used to call it appropriate, which is now sustainable. Um, there was a left in the middle. I did some programming, visual basic, and so on, uh, to understand um, how data management, that was 12 years ago. And then I did lots of uh, space syntax stuff. And the bottom right is, is to do with innovative teaching using three-dimensional digitization. So a bit of pedagogical research as well uh, through um, funding for innovation, innovation in teaching. So that's quite an interesting area I, I worked on as well. So, okay, so I arrived to, um, to Queens on the 1st of August. 2006, and then three weeks later, UNA had multi-million cap, uh, the Changing Aging Partnership funded by the Atlantic Philanthropies in Ireland, uh, whereby UNA was managing these um, seed grants, 10K seed grants, and uh, it was an amazing experience, and uh, it has led to lots of bigger grants and more research and more publications. So uh, since then, UNA has been my friend uh, and my mentor. Um, and you could see 10K led to two journal publications and to an MRC, UK Research Council uh, network funding. So sometimes very little money goes a long way. Um, so after that, I mean, um, I was fortunate, obviously, Judith helped me with um, support for this one, but also for the Cogworks. So thank you, Judith, as well. Uh, it has been amazing. Uh, so this one we looked at. Um, also occupancy evaluations of sheltered housing and to see what, what seems to work, but also we involved uh, multi-stakeholders, designers, uh, policy makers, and user groups, as you can see here, through interviews and focus groups. And I, two of my Masters of Architecture students, and not one of them is, hasn't arrived yet, um, has helped me with this one by doing uh, most of the post occupancy. And then uh, we did the focus group also supported by uh, Una in her Institute, then we can see uh, different uh, stakeholder groups. It was incredibly interesting, and it led to some really uh, very uh, useful insight on, uh, on the topic. And that experience, somehow, and with the people who had benefited from the Changing Aging Partnership funding, that critical mass came together, and we put a, a bid to MRC and their lifelong health and well being, and we were successful in the cogworks. And you can see Ulster, Sterling, Warwick, Turner. Warwick, because at the time, the late Elizabeth Burton went Brooks, and then she moved to Warwick, so the last one was Warwick. So then I met Elizabeth uh, Libby, who has been a uh, massive influence. She was a friend and a mentor, uh, and she's really missed uh, at the time. Um, so we worked on Kogos. So I'm going to explain a little bit what we have done, and then we'll go back uh, later on uh, to her legacy workshop. So we were looking at healthy cognitive aging, because we had... On the right-hand side, computer scientists at the top, Chris, Alison, social science from Sterling, uh, David, uh, a medical doctor, who uh, was a consultant in Alzheimer's, um, and then we had occupational therapists uh, from um, Panayota, from Brunel, 
uh, and obviously architecture and nursing. So it was quite interdisciplinary. Uh, and we were all looking at this healthy cognitive aging and independence in later life. Um, it was quite significant because there wasn't much done, but there were some hypotheses posited by us. And we wanted to look further into that, but we didn't have lots of money, so we had to resort to like very uh, small focus groups uh, in two locations. So we wanted to understand uh, how the physical environment um, or its role in compensating for deficiencies, because if somebody becomes disabled, either through an accident or through visual impairment or through cognitive impairment, how how can we uh, allow them to use the, the, the physical environment more efficiently without uh, any issues? Uh, then we looked at um, what are these issues? And, and one of these theses is, is this, that the handicap is not just deficiency, it's also uh, a badly designed uh, built environment. And I think it's true. Even the healthy person experiences sometimes some challenging uh, areas or moving around or, or navigating or understanding the physical environment, especially because of this multi-sensory, if there is too much noise or too much, uh, too much light, and, and, and so on. So one of the key uh, possible theories posited so far in 1973 by Lawton is this to do with the ecological model or the environmental press. You know? uh, as the, you become deficient, then the uh, built environment becomes much more challenging and so on. On the, right, on the left hand side, sorry, you can see that some people, well, 40 years later, they're still looking at this model. I'm looking at this model as well, and Isaiah in his PhD looked at that model as well. And you can see, which is the, um, on the red here, or pink, the level of care required. So as you move closer to low, you, you have to go to a nursing home. Or if you are too high, actually you can live normally in the community. But do we need this? And, and this is exactly what Odessa is looking at. We want to compact that, bring it very, very close to dropping nursing and possibly assisted living and moving the assisted living into the independent community living. So we're looking at not only the physical environment, but also technology, what technology can do to enable us to reach this, uh, this aim. So critical things uh, ahead, obviously, to look at. But beside that, there are also not just the environment, but the psychological and the social determinants. And we're looking at connected communities, for example, with David's work, and David's, uh, work which is uh, linking up with the physical uh, as well. So it's a combination of things. We cannot look only at the environment or the physical environment and say, yeah, we're going to solve the problem. It cannot be solved by one, one uh, aspect. Um, and then we uh, argued that dementia is actually uh, a cause for many things, and dementia is the news all the time. The latest being this dementia tax by Mary and company. So um, we need we need policies. We need more research in order to uh, understand it better. But if, even if it is not um, curable, how can we ensure that people with dementia can live normally in dementia-friendly communities, dementia-friendly environment, and, and, and so on? There are other things that we also uh, covered, which is to do with, uh, obviously, um, uh, lifestyle, being overweight or underweight, and so it's a, it can contribute to that, the cognitive decline, uh, but also exercise, um, both mental and physical exercise. So uh, playing puzzles and doing game brain training games are very important to keep the person sharp. So it's the physical, but also the mental, the cognitive. They have to go hand in hand. And then one more thing is to do with this mental well-being, which is the quality of housing. And I have tried to have the PhDs looking at that as well, and maybe some research proposal, but it is something I'd like to, to look further and into air quality, and, and this is where Fionn's work can also contribute to, you know, understanding how the indoor air quality can have an effect on, because it's, it's a major determinant of health. But we need to understand a little bit more uh, about that. There are other things like noise and uh, and crime and so on that also contribute to this uh, better, uh, worse uh, mental well-being. So we did this focus group and we finished with a, a conference, an um, international conference where we uh, presented and discussed uh, the work and, and I think if you want to look at it further, there is a, the, actually the information is still available including the presentations and, and some videos and, uh, and lectures. Then if you want to know a little bit more about the design for dementia, if you have a relative or a friend, uh, I suggest you visit uh, the, the SDC. They have really useful information on how to deal with um, 
the environment. Uh, you could do some really uh, very small adjustment to the kitchen, the living room, and so on, uh, with some significant uh, improvement to the well-being of the person with dementia. So they have a virtual care home. You could look and zoom through and so on. So it's very interesting. And for me, they are the, uh, the center of excellence world in the world. Uh, I don't think anybody has done better than that. Um, okay, so that's CogWorks. Now, when I arrived in New Climb, I thought, okay, um, I had time. So I thought, all right, I'm going to look at this timeline to understand. Not to look at literature review. That's easy. I thought I'm going to look at the funding, the UK government funding, and to some extent the EU funding in aging and the built environment. And I produced the mental map on the right-hand side. Um, it was uh, obviously a very um, elaborate task. But I said, I want to see how this funding is allocated, what, what is driving it, who is who is successful, what are they doing with those with those projects. Because we hear 1 million here, 2 million, 5 million here, but where is that body of knowledge? Unless they publish it, we don't see it. But OK, most of the time they publish. But you cannot capture it easily. So I, I did that, but I also the timeline showed when actually aging became important from the 40s, the societies being uh, set up and so on, and then uh, Lawton's model, and you keep moving and you see when the UK government became interested, uh, up to uh, living well with dementia, the Prime Minister challenge, uh, this is David Cameron's in 2012. And then at the bottom there, all the phases of um, funding of, of aging. So obviously the right hand side, oh, where are we gonna go? Uh, uh, so, for example, one of them is to do with phase three, and you can see, I think, we're going far, uh, where Libby was uh, was involved. So you can see that there is a pattern coming to do with physical exercise, mobility, uh, transportation, and so on. And then you can see more or less where the gaps are. Yeah? So you could correlate this with the with the, the, the knowledge the knowledge base and, and try to understand what what's happening. So anyway, I had a good idea. And that good idea somehow led to other ideas. And then about 18 months later, we were successful with Odessa. But for Odessa, I have to take where is Akin? Akin, yeah. So Akin called, called me from Beijing, says Tsinghua is interested. Shall we go for it? And say, yeah, let's go for it. So we put the bid quite, quite quickly. Um, and this bid was EU China understanding population change. Uh, they, had, they wanted to. Fund eight, one million each. So uh, we uh, had, we needed a European, another European partner, uh, and obviously Chinese partners. So Tsinghua, one of the leading universities in the country, and Dauphine in Paris is one of the social sciences and health uh, universities. It's a research, uh, it's a research-driven uh, university. So, um, so I think uh, Fion has already explained the acronym. I'm not going to go there, but we're looking at this aging in place and. Uh, uh, alternative care model, especially in China, because they're going to have uh, very soon more than 100 million old, old 85 plus and more than 300 million 65 plus. So the, the challenge for them is quite significant. And if they can learn from how the Europeans have dealt with um, managing, for example, care, both health but social care, although we're still um, struggling with social care in the UK. And I think the idea is to learn from the good practice in here. Uh, to, look, to look at financial models uh, and to see which one can be implemented in the, uh, in the Chinese context. But likewise, we're trying to learn from them in terms of managing large numbers, uh, in terms of the, the, the family uh, the organization, the living arrangements that they have, which are quite successful. So there are things that we can learn from both sides. And for that, we're looking at several things, including um, the longitudinal uh, uh, surveys of Elsa, Charles, uh, and the other one. Anyway, there are three, um, share and share the, the European one. So here in the, uh, in the UK with Tulika, Amy, and Junji, we are working um, on the uh, work package four, which is to do with age-friendly environment. Uh, and we have looked at case studies, as you can see in the UK and France and, and China, we produced this document, uh, where we looked at actually what are the, um, these teams and how are they um, reflected, uh, how how are they used in, in, in reality? So if we're talking about uh, safety, what is it? Or if it is uh, economics, what is it? And then we looked at some factors, the accessibility, the sensory, the cognitive in, in particular, 
uh, and so on. So we have some themes and some factors, and we looked at these case studies uh, through post-occupancy evaluations and, and some interviews with the uh, managers and so on. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. And then we did some exploratory focus group in China, uh, three, of three um, some with the retired professor in Tsinghua. They have 8,000 of them living on campus. Uh, so some of them are actually professors of architecture, like this gentleman here. Uh, he's 83, and he said, wait, I'm going to tell you what's inclusive design. I said, okay. So he, he gave us a lecture before we started the focus group on inclusive design. I said, yeah, very good, very good. Um, and it's a, he, he, he impressed us because he came with his Apple laptop, his iPhone. You can see his laser pointer. I mean, it's like, wow. Um, so age here is not really, oh, Nick, welcome. Um, Age is not really an excuse for not um, for not using technology. So, so, and I think as as we all age and our children, for them, technology is like you know, part of the daily life. And, come on, long protest. Okay, I'm, I'm so disappointed. Now. So anyway, so the focus group we looked at accessibility, sensory. Uh, we ran three: one with the professors. One multi generational, yeah. Uh, and third one again, third one with low income, with the low income. So, um, and there were differences, obviously. The, the professors, they have their own issues, they understood the built environment much better. Uh, and then the multi generation was interesting to, to get this, the different views from different people about technology and the differences between uh, the three generations. And, and as an example here, Amy, where are you? Amy, yeah. So, Amy, this is a PhD student here. Her mother on the right hand side and her grandmother in the middle. So we had three generations in one focus group, which was incredibly uh, interesting. So Amy has been a uh, fantastic uh, support for us in, in, in China, obviously. So we looked at that and then we looked also at the cognitive, which is an important part of, of, uh, of our work. Uh, and, and some themes, as you can see in the in vivo analysis, came about emotion, independence, memory loss, and, and also that dementia in China can be even taboo, can be people don't want to talk about, about it because it's become very uncomfortable. Uh, and some comments here, just one to, to do about technology, that it cannot replace emotions. So people say, no, I, I want people. I don't want, for example, those, uh, you know, the new technology with the pet uh, robots and so on. So, and we have friends actually in, China, in, in Ireland who have, uh, they're developing a, a robot companion for people with dementia. So there is research coming up, but it's going to take time for it to become mainstream and accepted uh, everywhere. So we looked also at the, the barriers and, um, and enablers and the needs. And you can see the cognitive in the purple in the middle is not really uh, significant because it's not very well understood. So it's going to require more explanation to a focus group setting so that it is uh, better understood. But you can see that technology, it has equally uh, needs and wants, but also barriers. So we need to know what works and what doesn't because technology is available. And in China, they have absolutely everything. If you, you went to an exhibition, it's absolutely fantastic. But mainstream housing does not have it. And that's the role of the Odessa project into um, proposing, here, which we are doing. So what we're doing now, it's a, 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 some focus group, which we did the UK, we did France, and there's China uh, next. And basically, we're looking at uh, user requirements and domain typology or rooms and so on. And the items that we have identified from literature review, from the um, focus group in China, from the case studies analysis. And we are trying to ascertain the level of importance in terms of independence, health, and safety from the perspective of, the, uh, of this focus group. And we have illustrations so they, they can understand. So, but we are making them also uh, talk. They do it individually, but then they talk as a group and they have to reach consensus. And that consensus, we must take it with us plus the audio recording. And we're going to look at uh, content and analysis as well as the quantitative that come from here. So we are doing the mainstream housing retrofit. Why? Because in the context of China, there's huge amount of housing. Most of it is not accessible. Some of them in the Tsinghua campus, 8,000 professors. If you live in the first, second, third, fourth floor, four, there's no lift. So if you have mobility issues, they move you to the ground floor. So that's not. That's not long term solution. So we need to look into how uh, this accessibility can be uh, resolved. But also, there's the, uh, the visual, uh, for example. Uh, and then there's the cognitive. When they start getting uh, early onset of dementia, how, how are they going to live in that? 
So we're doing that for mainstream, but also we're doing it for technology. We want to understand which technology people understand is useful and it's needed urgently and which actually can wait. And uh, some technology actually combines several. So which one are we going to uh, put forward? So once we agree this and based on the results, we're going to negotiate with our colleagues doing work package five on the financial models and our colleagues uh, David and Akin on com connected communities to see how we can overlap um, these recommendations so that we have a coherent proposal going forward. So, a final output is uh, this, the prophetic proposal, but also we are developing some scenarios. And these scenarios really are looking at this uh, longitudinal uh, surveys because now we know, for example, uh, in France, children tend to live closer to their parents. In the UK, the survey does not have this question. That's not what the French say, so what's wrong with you guys? You don't have these questions, and we have it, and China, they have it. So for us, it's slightly difficult to know which child lives closer to their parents in terms of support, for example. But living arrangements, we know more or less how the dynamics are happening. So we need to develop this um, position map here as an example. What I'm not on the wall. Um, we have, uh, we're going to propose some scenario based on the findings from the surveys, findings from the focus group, and the case studies. And we can say, well, they could have very uh, positive cognitive health, but really good overall health, physical health, and you know, could be more beneficial. So how are we going to deal with that? So, as you can see, they're all like in the negative bottom uh, left hand uh, bottom. So, and then we're going to correlate them with colleagues doing uh, the other. Along the six uh, criteria. Okay, so this is the quick uh, overview of the research so far. But what does it mean in policy and practice? So, unless one is very aggressive to push forward the policy and practice, it's going to be incredibly difficult to make research really uh, reach the people. So, one of them is uh, the policy aspect, which is the ability of scholars that has driven this inclusivity and pluralism, equality health, and then later the commission of architecture, which doesn't exist anymore, which has the end. And these are somehow have driven the policy. There are more, I'm going to show you a timeline in a moment where you can see how this policy has uh, influenced the, the development of, of standards. Now, one important, um, I wouldn't call it standards, it is the guidelines, and now it has been shown, uh, and Habitat are really, really upset what the government has done uh, a few years ago. Um, it's lifetime homes, 16 criteria uh, to look at this um, aspect of designing homes where you could age in place. You don't need to, to move, really, um, because you will have a bedroom on the ground floor, it will be accessible, it will be vis visitable, and so on and so on. So a couple of PhDs is new, and we want to have a look at this. They have expanded it, uh, and we were hoping that this is going to become a BSI standard, and what, two years ago, they, actually they became uh, standard in 2011 for public housing, 2013 for private housing. Obviously the private housing developers, they lobbied the government, uh, is saying this, arguing this is going to cost them lots of money. So now it was pushed aside. And part M, as you can see, has taken some of it, but not all of it. Has taken the visitor, visitable dwelling, for example, which are using. But is it, is it age friendly? That's a question. And I think a couple of people like us need to be much more aggressive into uh, lobbying with the government and with the BSI to turn the research uh, into really standards so that the architects can start to use it. Another one is the Dementia uh, Development uh, Services Center in Sterling. We have produced the Dementia Edit 2, which is very useful. I've used it in some of my research. Um, if you want to see, learn a little bit more about it, uh, you, you, could, you could download it, actually it's available. Um, which is incredible, and lots of architects are using, uh, using it to, especially to do health environments like hospitals and health centers. There is more, the DSDC Forget Me Not Garden, obviously because of the wandering and so on, it's a very useful uh, landscape garden planning uh, tool. On the left hand side, you can see what the Americans are doing. They use uh, themes, they use uh, retro style, they use a uh, prompt learning art in the world, so it gives this depth, but actually it's just a mural. So there are techniques uh, used, but they are not really um, standard, basic standards of, of, of 
occupancy development commitments. Now, last year, or not long ago, or six months or so ago, I was approached by the Helen Hamlin, and I was really surprised. They said, oh, we're doing a, a new startup on new diversion people, experience with the Brinkley Hamlin. I said, wow, I had no idea. Why? Because the Helen Hamlin Center, they, it's an aggressive center. They want to be there. They want to do things. Right? And they assure them, because they got the BSI on board, but they don't have the, they don't have the research. So they got the BSI, and they say, oh, let's do research. So they did like a Delphi study, interview. They interviewed me, interviewed other people, and they did a focus group. And then they come up with sensor research, sensor layer of flooring, which 15 years or 20 years ago, Sarah and Judith had something like that. It was slim and everything else like that. So I'm quite puzzled, and I don't understand um, why this is happening. Why, why some people seem to really get to, to the government together? Maybe because I remember. Anyway, um, and you can see they are also productive. They have design for dementia. They have one on autism, very interesting, and they have one on independent living. So they are so quite productive. But I don't know what is uh, driving all this. Now I put the timeline very quickly. You can just look at the blue, the blue ones. And you can see that from the 70s, there was this um, the Disability and Persons Act. And then Lifetime Homes started in the early 90s, which by now, really, in nearly 20 years, years, we should have really reached something significant. But instead of using those 27 years to reach a really a true standard, I like to really have them. So you can see Part M has taken some of the Disability Act, then Cape came in, and then nothing happened in the Northeast, but after that, no action till 2010, 11, 12. But the last one is this BSI Neurodivergent 2016, whether it's going to become active or not, we'll see. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that there is scope for us to also influence the BSI. And this one determined to do it, and I am. Uh, so very quickly, just to illustrate, because some of you may say, what is he talking about? What, is, what does it mean in the built environment? You know? So I'm showing you here Japan. Japan started this a long, long time ago, maybe 60 years ago, because they had an aging population, which they realized in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, and then they said, well, we have to deal with it. So um, mobility was an issue, and the visual impairment was an issue. So you can see they took it incredibly seriously. I mean, uh, if you have been to Japan, you will see this. Uh, the, this uh, tactile surfaces and so on. Um, I need to get faster now. So I'm just going to zoom through Japan. You can see even the staircase, they have the tactile and so on. Loss of, a wet loss of. But I thought it was very interesting because of the color, the color used, and the tactile part of it. Slightly better than we will see also. Well done is this trash one level um, case, which um, there was a control problem. There was some discussions about here behind. Ten centimeters is its medium. I don't know how you feel when you walk around. Do you need that ten, uh, ten centimeters or no centimeters? The fluorescent type in Helsinki, uh, Beijing also fluorescent and yellow and, and so on and tactile. Uh, Beijing again, the Netherlands also flash is at the same level. Uh, and maybe you were around a little bit again because the hometown is not around. I mean, incredible. This is a developing country with amazing transportation system uh, and mobility. Quite incredible. Uh, and then cyclists who have taken it one step further, they not only have a very accessible street and so on, but they put even gyms so that people exercise uh, outdoors. Even you don't need to go to the gym or whatever, and you can do it uh, pretty casually. Okay, so quite quickly now to um, I spend five minutes on Libby's uh, symposium. I will show some of you one now. And as you can see, the two title is Design for Well-being in the built Environment. Uh, and I think um, with, with um, Judith and her myself, we were somehow uh, working quite closely together to make this, um, this um, topic. Uh, Judith has retired. Every time I ask her to do work, so <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, so I think we, need, we have a duty to, to move it forward. So that meeting, uh, the workshop, which was well attended, people from all over the world, all Libby's collaborators and, and uh, friends in the game, uh, and we participated in that. Uh, in that workshop to develop a charter for well-being within the environment. And basically, we're able to 
define principles, the problem, the plan of action, the well-being uh, objectives, which we did. Uh, so there was here, you can see Nicola Dempsey on the left, uh, and Kiki on the, on, the, on the top of the group, and, and brainstorms, and so on, and you can see some of them. There's also uh, a video there on the right. So that was um, a bit of a story where the incredibly emotional uh, game of two days. So the principle, well-being should be central goal. So architects actually, by default, really, we don't need to, by default, we should, we should. Um, the problem, most of the time we don't involve the people, oh, it's co-design, co-production. So this is becoming slightly uh, mainstream now, like uh, our Duel uh, project has done this co-design, co-production of, uh, of housing designs. Uh, this, the role of people, different people, different groups, or multi interdisciplinary, multi-stakeholder, we have to keep it always in mind, otherwise it becomes a narrow, uh, silo type. And then, um, how can people flourish? They can flourish if we give them a, a good design, a positive design, or enable design. So that was the message, yeah? Now, from Edie, which I'm determined to move forward. Now my stars, the three of them in this room. Yeah, thank you, Walter. Uh, <laughs> um, so, reality couldn't come and put you into it, so, but uh, you know, as you and as you. I'm just going to show quickly how the three of you also have helped me move forward. Um, Nick was my Master's of Architecture student when I transitioned to take a PhD in studentship. And uh, I think he produced something quite uh, amazing and incredibly useful uh, to help architects use, uh, obviously, CAD, which they do all the time, in order to make it easy for them to take their pictures of design. So uh, Nick had to learn programming, which was incredibly challenging, I remember. But he's done incredibly well. He drives a Porsche now. And, and I'm still waiting for my I'm still waiting for my share. So I'll be waiting for a long time. Yeah. Well done, Nick. Uh, Verity looked at um, wayfinding success in long-term care setting. It's a very intensive study. And you can see here, for example, Nick co-supervised with computer science, architecture leading, uh, and Verity and Leon are co-supervised with Dr. from Psychology. So the, this interdisciplinary thing is incredibly important. You cannot solve problems by one unique discipline. It's not possible. Very interesting studies with people with dementia at different uh, levels. Um, so, because I don't have time, I just need to bring it to play. Uh, um, and she used this um, fishbone cause and effect, which is absolutely astonishing. Uh, amazing amount of work, and they're very useful. So using space syntax and video capture. Uh, and then also um, feedback from the users. And we found out, and she found out, that actually a person with dementia uses the sensory, the smell, and the hearing in order to compensate for memory. So, so that was quite, quite significant, I think. Um, and then Cleona, um, who also produced an amazing uh, piece of work to do with this lifetime home, uh, look at lifetime home, but also part and standards uh, and visual impairments. And, uh, Cleon also has been quite productive in, in publication uh, in this um, uh, And this, Cleon has, and uh, all of them actually should inform BSI standards. And that's my feeling. It's like there is no point to spend so much energy and effort into doing this if we don't take it further. And I think that's, that's what we are working on. So there are different levels of, of knowledge here that we can push forward in terms of. And Isaiah, lastly, he had the uh, support of uh, the NHS, actually, for his PhD as a partner, and uh, with Shampika here as a co-supervisor, so we also dealt with occupational health, and I think an aging workforce is, is going to be us soon, me soon, and uh, we're going to be working until 70s, maybe 80s, I don't know. Um, I was telling Dan that there's more retirement. Uh, uh, so this is one way of also trying to understand how we make the uh, the uh, workplace as actually age friendly, which it isn't at the moment. Most workplaces are not age friendly. I'm nearly finished, just a couple of slides now. This is a slide that shows my semester one architecture studio. So some, these are students who just arrived, they don't know what architecture is. They say, okay, it's okay, it's gonna take me five years. So I tell them, Marcus Rodriguez is actually first century BC. He's written this 
10 books of architecture. Okay, it was found by Charles in early Renaissance. 1,000, 2,000, long time ago, right? I mean, my colleagues architects will understand this. He had chapter four called The Choice of Healthy Situations. And if you read it, if you can read it, and you can read, right? So I'm not gonna read, and you can see. But there's something, that he obviously wrote this in the Mediterranean. And I know in the Mediterranean, the west facing buildings is a nightmare, especially in the hot. And he says here, never do that because it becomes so, so hot. Sunrise and so on. There's so many things that he was aware of. But lots of architects, I swear to God, they don't. Really, they don't. They say, West, where? Obviously, in England here, the West is not an issue. But there are other issues, like don't put them on the swamps. He said that. And we do put them on swamps. Hence the flooding. Now, this is last final fun bit. Um, we talk about research and well-being, other people's well-being, but what about our well-being? Your well-being. Yeah? Because it's great, we all work, we have to go and do the work, and I think last staff meeting, we talked about well-being of the work. Yeah, okay, it can happen, but when you leave the work, what do you do? Yeah? So you have to keep your mind busy, you have to keep your body busy and sane. So what I do? I'm a very uh, avid football player, I played football at a competitive level, Nowadays, this is me, young, when I was 23. Now I can play only five minutes, really good. And you can tell Amir, he can tell you, my teammate and friend. And 55 minutes I work. Uh, so, and then uh, two days of agony after that. Uh, and when I was in Oxford, in between the Anfield and PhD, I worked as a cool chef, sous chef, and chef. If you are a good friend, if you behave yourself, I'll cook something for you. Okay? And the last one is I am road smart. Anybody knows? Not you, Nick. Anybody knows what it is? All right. So Nick, about a long time ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I told Nick, hey, why don't we do this? I said, yes. It's the Institute of Advanced Motoring. And it's a great thing. It's a charity that what it does, it makes uh, better drivers, safer drivers, because we're stuck with these cars, especially cities like this one. So, so I am an advanced driver. And I coach uh, driving, including driving instructions. So if you drive a lot and you want to polish your driving, don't come to me. Go to the IAM. <laughs> they may send you to me. Wait, there's one in South Yorkshire. OK? So finally, there's so many people. I'm going to say thank you, really. The top row is my family. It's my wife, my son, my mom, and dad who passed away, my brothers, my sisters, and the brother after that passed away, sadly another brother younger, and my mother-in-law, and my brother-in-law, cousin. And then Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed has been by my side for 37 years. It's, it's, I told you, putting this Facebook page killed me. Uh, and I think there'll be no talk without Facebook page. But there are people who are, has been with me all my life, and um, obviously I didn't have space for my current colleagues because I was on a few Facebook pages. But, but I'm also taking uh, everyone here, and uh, it's a great place. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I feel part of the family. I felt part of the family almost immediately. Uh, and I'm looking forward to some great time together. Um, and you can rely on me. So huge thank you to, to all of you, and uh, a huge thank you to those that joined us today. Thanks.
know, you can just take that as a gift. Yeah. Thank you. I'm also lucky. Um, lucky so. um, that's great. And, and uh, I would just really encourage all of us to, to think about the things you've introduced to us. <laughs> we can have lunch. I am thinking yeah, because of some bad bikers yeah. around. Yeah. Traditionally, it's been an illegal lunch. Yeah. 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 Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.